So without further ado, I would like to introduce to you the Mayor of Rockford, Larry Morrison. Very excited to have you. Actually, it's an interesting story. Earlier today, I was um, uh, sent a, an email by someone who was really discouraging me from coming here tonight. Hmm. Uh, because unlike uh, what was uh, said about the principles of the Tea Party and why you're here, uh, this person who sent me the email, I don't know if they were trying to look out for my best interests or whatever, but was just filled with all kinds of discussion about me. That I shouldn't associate myself with hate speech. I shouldn't oh. associate myself uh, with, uh, with you, uh, because your brother, Matthew Hale, who's in jail, uh, when I don't even think you have a brother. I do not have a brother. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, I mean, it's, it's almost funny, except when you, you, you oh, yeah. I think we're living through a time period, you know, I've heard this discussion at the national level, where folks are saying, well, the folks like the Tea Party are just trying to, you know, fear monitor or whatever. Yeah. I think we just got to be careful, because the shoe could be also on the other foot, right? where folks are trying to intimidate me from being in this meeting tonight by suggesting that I, somebody who was accused of uh, trying to put a, or at least trying to put a hit on a, on a federal judge is somehow associated with you or this group. You know, and I just told the person, I'm going to go there tonight, I'm going to promise to be there tonight. I have no knowledge of, of this group ever associating itself with hate speech. Um, and I certainly don't have any knowledge. And I <coughs> checked and I said, you, you know, with, with David, you're not related to Matthew Hale, right? No, doesn't he have a brother? I just encourage this person to make sure that they're not being manipulated and they need to check their facts. But I also want to make sure we have a forum within our community, and I also sent this and said this in the email. I will go to any group to talk about these issues of the city budget and fiscal responsibility and how we manage our affairs and what my philosophy is about government. Um, I want to have the fair chance to get my message out. I want our community to have a chance, have a chance to ask me questions. And I certainly don't want to have an atmosphere within our community where somebody's trying to intimidate somebody else from exercising free speech, from engaging in an analysis of how we govern our affairs. We live in an extremely, uh, some might call it exciting time, definitely a time of change within government. And I know myself when I first decided to run for mayor, uh, uh, you know, uh, David was a uh, uh, nice to focus on the 2005 election when I won, but I ran in 2001 when I lost, right? And I got beat in 2001, ran again in 05, run, ran both times and continue to run as an independent. So I know a little bit about taking on the establishment. You know, in Rockford, to run as an independent, you have to get thousands of signatures to, just to get on the ballot. Ballot access is an issue in our country and our community right here in Rockford, Illinois. And if you want to make change, you got to understand there's a lot of powers, and I think you guys already know this, there's a lot of powers out there who will do everything they can to try to control. And I don't care if it's, and this is something you and I had a chance to talk about when we sat down one one you know, I had a, I'm an independent, I got a real problem with government on both sides of the line, Republicans and Democrats, that sort of, you know, they cut deals left and right local level, national level, state level, Amen. and it's somewhat this oligopoly. And, and what's the common theme between them all? Big. Right? Big government, big unions, big yeah. business. Big is, to me, one of the great challenges of our time. Because what happens when you have deals cut amongst the big players? Well, we've known this since the really dawn of our country. Uh, competition is good. Monopolies tend to do what? Great inefficiencies, ineffectiveness. Corruption. And when you look at our system that we've created, again, the reason why I've been independent for a long time, I didn't know, so I knew what I believed, I didn't know what the parties believed, and I cast myself in a position where I said, you know, I, I know these local issues, I know these Rockford issues, I'm going to start there. And what I knew was happening, and it's happening today in these elections locally, the long arm of Washington, the long, long arm of Springfield, if we're not very careful, it will try to control local races. Mm -hmm. Look at the money being spent on television today in these local races that's not Rockford money. You think they're doing it without wanting a payback? It's about control. So yeah. when I always, you know, I give credit to everybody here tonight for showing up and trying to regain back control over how we manage our local affairs. If you give me just a couple more minutes, then I'll, I'll stay as long as you want me here to take questions that are germane 
But I want to talk about what I think is the issue of the day when it comes to the fiscal management of our local community. Um, you know, outsourcing is a hot issue in these days. I've talked about needing to outsource potentially to become more efficient and effective. There's one area of outsourcing that I demand that we take back because we outsourced it uh, quite a long time ago. We outsourced in a very real way the management of our city organization and other government bodies did the same thing. We outsourced it to very strong interests in public employee unions. And I'll give you the specific example. Right now in Rockford, Illinois, you may have just uh, read about it in last week's news. <clears throat> we received a decision and an arbitration. We wanted to get back control of how we manage and deploy our resources. We have a limited amount of resources. We could put in police, fire, public works. You know, there's a handful of core things that we're engaged in. Who should make those decisions about how we deploy resources? In my opinion, it's at the root of our democracy. It should be the duly elected representatives reflecting the will of our people. In this case, in this case, I can't explain what the decision was. The arbitrator said, you can shut down fire stations, but you essentially can't reduce your manning of your organization. We can't lay people, well, we could lay people off, but we'll have to have, even though we decide to outsource our ambulance service, even though we cut, make other cuts, we have to have 64 firefighters on call, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, end of story. Even though it would lead to what I believe is an absurd result, which contract law I didn't think was supposed to lead to absurd results. Uh, by the way, these are provisions in a contract made possible by laws that passed Springfield and then current local uh, rulings regarding arbitration decisions. And actually, the arbitration decisions uh, I'm told that set this stuff in motion was that either in the late 1990s or the early part of this decade. Uh, decisions that built in this nu uh, a magic number that said you had to have so many people on call. And it was originally built around this idea of how many people you should have to staff a given fire truck. Now, here's the absurdity of it. So now we've got an arbitrator telling us that this is going to be the rule for running the Rockford Fire Department. If there are four, generally speaking, four people on an engine company, even any fire suppression uh, a device. So if we're going to put on a fire, protocol says you have to have four. This leads to this number of 64 people. And that ultimately leads to the, since you have to do it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, leads to the size of um, how big our fire department is. Well, think about this absurdity. The people who control that, the majority of them don't live in the city of Rockford. Mm. The fire union, almost 70% of our firefighters, our union firefighters, live outside the city. Now here's the interesting thing. They're living outside the city in fire protection districts. Now what do we know about the local fire protection districts? Anybody ever been a volunteer firefighter? In a fire protection district, you're lucky to have an engine, let alone four people on an engine. The firefighters are able to have a level of service, demand, and control in Rockford that they don't have protecting their own families. If you call and you're in Roscoe, you're in Rockton, you're in Machesi Park or Loves Park, and one of those uh, uh, area fire protection districts or departments coming in, it's going to be made up of <coughs> not four people on an engine, probably two or three, and they're going to be made up of a lot of volunteers, part-timers. Now, I think that's a great thing. You know why? And by the way, I'd say our firefighters also think it's a great thing because it leads to lower taxes. Who set this rule? We tried to get a, Dave Winters helped us try to get a, a law passed this past spring that would have given us relief from that arbitrary manning number set by the arbitrator years ago. And I got my tail kicked in by the folks, many, most of the folks in that committee, the labor committee, guess what? They're from Chicago. They don't have a dog in the race. So when the, when the firefighters union cuts a check to one of those folks in Chicago to support either pension rules or their work rules supporting the firefighters, what do those folks from Chicago care? It's not impacting them. Right. We're downstate. They're not downstate. They're Chicago. Chicago's a special case. And I literally was running into this kind of absurdity where I'm making all my arguments and all my points. They didn't care. They don't want to hear it because I'm not writing them checks. The people in Springfield who are getting the greatest voice on a lot of those issues are the people writing checks to campaigns. And the mayor's union 
doesn't exist, right? Mm -hmm. I wish sometimes that it did. Maybe we'd have a little bit more success in Springfield. So our own, what I said to him is, all right, I'm going to be back on that issue, trying to regain control, because my, my opinion is we should need, in Rockford specifically, we need to be putting more resources right now in police. That's where our real problems are. We're doing fine at fire. Uh, we have plenty of room to cut back, and it could save us millions if we just reduced our manning level down from four to three on a given fire suppression. And like I said, there's people, I talked to the mayor of, uh, it was Moline at a conference recently, they were trying to go from three down to two. He said, four? Who's got four anymore? I said, we do. And it's, a, it's an arbitrator in a state system that's keeping us from making local decisions about our local resources. So my next time down in Springfield, we're going to try to reintroduce that bill. I can't be alone. Because if I'm alone down there, I know that the firefighters union will be extremely well represented yeah. by firefighters from across the state. They do, you know, and I told this to our police union, said you guys, you know, they had this rally last night at City Hall. The fact of the matter is, if they want to keep as many jobs as they can, when we have the budget problems we have today, you know, with, with they better either become better negotiators down in Springfield or better negotiators here with our community because otherwise the firefighters got to be, they got a minimum manning clause in their contract and fire, they don't police. And so it leads to, again, these absurd results where our decisions about local tax dollars and how we deploy them are being made essentially by groups that don't live in the city. They may be in Springfield, they're connected to national organizations, uh, they live outside our area, and that to me is not taxation with representation. Right. It's something very, very different. Mm -hmm. We have a five and a half million dollar budget hole in next year's city budget. I said <coughs> over and over and over, I refuse to raise taxes to pay for things that we're already spending too much money on. <laughs> I, I guarantee you this, if we, you know, if we were to raise utility taxes, let's say, to be able to deal with this and the crisis passes and the economy gets better and people aren't paying attention as much, what will happen? The waste will continue. Yeah. It's only because of this current crisis that there's the focus that I think gives us the chance to make changes. Uh, by the way, I was having challenges with our, our union negotiations when I first got elected in 05, before the market crash in 08, before the collapse of the housing uh, market in our country. And frankly, when people say how tough my job might be today, I said, you know, in a real way, it's easier today because the community's focused. Because people are saying enough's enough, we're tired of it, we don't want to overpay. We're not saying we got, want to get rid of the fire department either. We're not, we have a lot of great firefighters. I have a brother-in-law who's a firefighter. Happens to live in Chesley Park. That's all right, too. But what I've said is um, the rules that our citizens have to live by, we should live by a different set of rules. And right now we are, and, and I'll leave it with this. Pension reform has to take place in November. This November, there's a chance to start the process. I don't I have no illusion that we're going to complete the process. By the way, completing the process, I would say us moving to a defined contribution system um, uh, instead of a defined benefit and a, a, a system like we have today. 401k, defined contribution system. You know what your liability is. We pay it every year. The system we have today is making multi-multi-millionaires out of our public safety employees and we said we can't afford it. Just real quickly, if, if a firefighter or police officer starts work at age 23, they can retire 30 years later with 75% of their highest wage for the rest of their life and the life of their spouse. Now, I don't know about you, but you do the math, 23, 33, 43, that means they're either retire at age 53. And here's the other kicker. 3% automatic increase cost of living adjustment every year. So while the headline might say about current employees, firefighters take a wage freeze, that's only for the current firefighters, right? For the retirees, they're getting an automatic 3% increase every single year. And you think about it right now, we have actually more retired firefighters than we have active. So we give a pay increase to every firefighter percent, even while the existing firefighters may not have had an in increase like that. We have major, major problems. 